Well, good morning and welcome to church. And uh, it's exciting to be here today. And uh, it's going to be a great day as we look at uh, the Christmas story and look at Mary and, and talk about, man, what it must have been like to have been have that announcement from the angel Gabriel about this amazing thing that was getting ready to happen. I'd like to invite you to stay and remain seated for just a moment, and uh, we're going to have a video it's as we begin our service. My mama told me something when I was growing up that has forever changed my life. She played the piano at our little church at 3rd and Pine Street for 37 years. She tried to teach me to play the piano, <laughs> but I wasn't very good. She would teach me the names of the notes, what a major key is, what a minor key is. She tried to teach me musical theory, but I was just bored. Then one day, she told me that the best news in the world is found by playing a simple scale on the piano. I had no idea what she meant, so she told me to play an eight note scale. So I did. I said, how is that good news? And she said, I played it incorrectly and that I needed to play it the other way. So I did. Again, I said, how is that good news? And she said, I played it the right way, but I needed to add the pauses. The pauses, she said, the pauses, add them on the first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. Now, I was frustrated and said, how can eight notes with random pauses be the best news in the world? Then I got up, walked away, and went outside. Frankly, I didn't care what she was talking about. I didn't like playing the piano anyway. Well, years later, my mama got sick and passed away. As I was thinking about her, I remembered what she told me about the piano. Not only that, I still remember the notes she told me to pause. The first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. So I sat down at her piano and played the scale with the pauses. That's when I realized the good news she was talking about. Amen. Will you stand with us as we sing this morning, Joy to the World?
the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love.
Well, that's what Christmas is. And uh, I don't know about you, but I kind of needed to be reminded of that. You know, we go through the season and we have so much that's going on. We have our Christmas parties and we have this realization that it's a week until Christmas and my wife's birthday, you know, <laughs> just to double the pressure, right? And uh, in all seriousness, um, it's so easy to get lost in all of this, isn't it? Isn't it easy to just kind of just get caught up and almost find yourself saying, wow, I can't wait until this week is over. And uh, this is the week that, that is the reason for the celebration that we do every Sunday. This is this, what, what is leading up, this week is leading up to. It's, it's a day that, that, that began what changed our world. It's, it's a day that our Savior came. That God became man, and, and he lived among us, and he did it in such a humble and, and just, just a crazy way um, as he came to, to die for us. And so as, as we sing these songs this morning, I, I hope that it's more than just singing some Christmas carols, and I hope that it just kind of prepares your heart for this week and the reminder that this is about Jesus. Let's pray together. Most Holy God, we want to thank you for this morning together, and I, I just love coming together to worship. It just, it centers us. It just causes us to just refocus on, on what really matters. It, it, it just, as we begin to sing these songs, and especially these familiar songs, and, and we were reminded that, that you came into this world and and everything changed, and, and we changed, and we get to be different because of what you did. And God, I thank you for the love that you've shown us, for the grace that you've shown us, for the mercy that you show us every day. And God, I pray you just help us to just protect our hearts from this week of craziness and busyness, and just remember that this is about you. And God, today we want to do that as we just worship you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
dismiss our children for Children's Church. And uh, by the way, last night I got to say these words, but I'm going to say them again. It's my pleasure to be the first to introduce to our church, Mr. and Mrs. Eric Wolf. Yeah? <laughs> Bryant is such a slave driver that Eric had to play this morning. They got married last night, right? And now I did to make him play. He made him do the devotion for the worship team. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> We're excited for you guys, and congratulations. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about Mary and, um, and just kind of continue that story that's leading up to this day that we're celebrating coming up in this week to come. And I'm going to start off kind of like you would on some TV series previously in Luke chapter 1, you know. God had sent an angel to Zechariah, and Zechariah was a priest, and he was serving in the temple. Um, his wife Elizabeth, they were older, they had been unable to have children. And an angel appears to him as he's serving in the temple and tells him that he's going to have a child. It's their prayer to have a child be answered. And, and they were going to give birth to the one who was prophesied to be the, the forerunner for Jesus, the one who was to go before him and prepare the way. And Zechariah said, how can I be sure my wife and I were, were old? And Gabriel tells him he was sent by God because of his lack of faith that he wouldn't be able to speak until the child was born. And then the child is, 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 you know, his wife becomes expecting. And you see in Luke chapter 1 and verse 26, the story continues. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So this is Gabriel, the same guy who appeared to, to uh, Zechariah to tell him about John the Baptist he was going to be born. And he shows up again six months later to, uh, to Nazareth in, in, in Galilee. And he shows up to talk to a, to a young girl named Mary. So now you got to understand, this is Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And he shows up in this little town it's, Nazareth is nowhere. I mean, pretty much, if you look back in their day, it's not a, no major roads passed through, that passed through Palestine, went through Nazareth. Um, it was about 60 or 70 miles from, from Jerusalem. That doesn't sound like a long way, but they're walking, right? This, this is, they're not jumping the car, I think we're going to drive to Jerusalem. They were about 15 miles from the Sea of Galilee and about 22 miles from the Mediterranean. And so they're, they're just kind of in this little nowhere place, and it, it reminds me of some places that, where my parents grew up. My, my mom grew up in this place called Science Hill. I think I may have told you the story. Is watching this movie, Tom Cruise is in, and the aliens are invading the world, and they keep repeating the day over and over again. And this, this drill sergeant, every day that day repeats, he says, I'm from a little town in Kentucky called Science Hill. I'm like, what? You know, nobody's ever heard of Science Hill. There's about 20 people that live there. My dad's from a little place called Broadhead, Kentucky, and... You know, it's just kind of crazy. Nazareth was kind of one of those places. It was a place where no, nothing was really expected there. And as you begin to look at Gabriel, he's appearing to this, this young girl named Mary. And just to put this in perspective, like we need to kind of understand. We, we have this vision of Mary and who she is. And we picture this, this like mom-like looking lady. And, and we picture this somebody who is not really what she was. Um, in Roman culture in their day, uh, girls got married at, at 12. Guys, 14. Um, it was not uncommon. Jews kind of followed that, and they would go even perhaps maybe a, even a little bit younger. They're typically engaged at 12, betrothed for a year. Think an eighth grader, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what we're talking here, right? Very likely. Mary was, was, was a child. I mean, she was, in our day, we would consider a child 12, 13 years old, maybe. And, uh, and this angel appears to her, and, and she's, she's, she, this message is given to her, and, and we know that she's a virgin, and she's in this betrothal period, and, 
And in, in, not, in a short period of time, she has these plans for her life. And she's going to marry Joseph. And, and it says in Isaiah 7, 14, that this is a fulfillment of a prophecy back in Isaiah. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and calls, call him Emmanuel. And, and Mary's going to be that person. You know, I, I, I sometimes, I, I have trouble wrapping my head around the kind of person that God chooses to use. And I began thinking about Mary. I just began thinking about, man, who was she? She's this, this teenager, and, and she's from a nowhere town, and she seems to be nobody special, nothing really notable about her family. They're apparently pretty poor because when Jesus is dedicated in the temple, they're giving a poor person sacrifice, just a couple of doves. And it is, as you look at this and, and you see what they're sacrificing, um, it just, it's just kind of crazy. I mean, many of us would have an issue with a 12-year-old babysitting our kids. And God looks at, at Mary and says, Mary's the one. Mary's the one who I'm going to choose to, to, to have my son born to. He, she's going to be the mother of my son. How do you respond if you're Mary when something like this happens? How do you respond? I think your response would probably be pretty similar to Mary's. Mary's initial response to being, cho to being chosen was to be afraid. If you look at Mark in Luke chapter 1, Mary's response when Gabriel shows up and begins talking to her and begins telling her what's going to happen, it says Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. She's troubled. This, this angel appears. And says, why are you appearing to me? Of all people, why me? And she's, she's afraid because the angel has to say, don't be afraid. You found favor with God. And I, I think that that reaction is a pretty normal reaction. You know, we read about all the people that God used in the Bible, and we seem to think that they're some kind of like, like superhuman, super spiritual people. But in reality, they were just like you, and they were just like me. And it's, it's scary when God shows up at your door and knocks on it and says, I want to use you. You know, it's, it's kind of crazy. You, you have different plans. Mary had different plans. She, she's planning out her life. She's, she's living this dream. She's, she's probably looking forward to this day when she's going to get married. And, and, and everything's going to change now. How's he going to use you? Why would he use, why not somebody else? Why not, why not pick somebody else? Why me? I know, that, I know that for me, I wish I could say that I was like Mary when God came knocking at my door. I, I wasn't. I'll just be honest. Um, I, I had given my life to camp uh, you know, when I was in high school, and it was a very serious thing for me. And I meant every word that I said, God, if you can use me, I, I, I'm available. You know? But I felt pretty safe. I didn't feel like God would ever choose me. Um, I felt like I was the last person that God would ever choose to use. And... Um, God began knocking on my door in my third year in college, and uh, I'll be honest, I had other plans. I was looking to go in other directions. I was dating a girl who I liked a lot, wound up marrying her, right, you know? And, um, you know, he began knocking on my door, and I didn't answer right away. I was like, yeah, are you sure you're getting this one right? Because... You know, I, I was terrified at the thought of being in front of people. I know that may sound weird to you because I've been doing it for so long here. But, you know, when I, I, I was petrified. Anybody who saw me in high school, I was in, a, I was in a jazz band in high school. We did a concert for, our, for the whole school. They had to do it in two assemblies at Princeton. And uh, I had a solo. And I was visibly the sh it was a flugelhorn solo. I was visibly, my hands were shaking. The instrument was shaking. The notes were wavering. You know, it was, people felt sorry for me. It was the most terrifying moments of my life. Even when I got in Bible college, I was, uh, I, 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 I knew that I had to do it. And there, I had to take public speaking because that's kind of what you do when you're, when you're in the ministry, right? And uh, it, it kept me up. It, you know, a, a one-minute speech, a two-minute speech, a five-minute speech, it just kept me up. And I thought, I, I don't know if I could do this. And 
Then there was a class we had to take called Preacher's Workshop. And in Preacher's Workshop, you had to stand up in front of the class and you had to preach a sermon. And then the class would grade you and then you had, they would videotape it and you'd have to go back and watch it. I, I honestly didn't know if, I, I mean, I, I know we say these things, I, did, I didn't know if I could physically do it. I thought I would have a heart attack or something might happen. I mean, just to put it in perspective, I remember the first time I preached at my church growing up, I, I'd been at Bible college for a little while and the preacher had me preach a little short, you know, d- devotion or sermon. It was like it, uh, multiple people were preaching that night. And, um, and I was sitting there, and it started right here, and everything started to go numb. <laughs> you know, you ever have your foot fall asleep? Did you know that can happen in your chest too? I can tell you that it does, right? And it just started working its way down. It started working its way down to my legs, and I kept thinking, if he doesn't call me soon, um, I'm not going to be able to stand up, <laughs> you know? It was terrifying to me. And I began to look, I began to think, you know, when God knocked at my door, I was afraid. I was afraid of what that might mean. I was afraid of what God might want me to do. I was afraid that my life plans might change. And, 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 I, and I began to kind of, kind of put it off. And then God kept knocking. And, and eventually I said, yes, you know. How would you respond if God became knocking at your door? I wasn't married. I didn't respond right away. God, take me, use me immediately how you want. And I'm, I'm not, you know, that's not something I'm, I'm really, uh, you, know, you know, proud of. But Mary was, was somebody different here. How would you respond if God knocked at your door right now? God knocks at your door and says, you know what? You, you, you've, you've been serving me. You've been growing in your relationship with me. Um, I want to use you. I want you to be a pastor. I want you to be a missionary. I want you to be a Sunday school teacher. I want you to step up and start a Bible study. I want you to lead one. I want you to, you fill in the blank, right? It's terrifying. Because we look at ourselves and we feel like that we're, we're, we're not enough. We feel like that, that we can't use God. How would God use us, you know? And so Mary, Mary's kind of feeling the same thing. You know, Mary's greatly troubled at his words. And, and she's afraid because she's like, what does this all mean, right? And then God actually tells her through Gabriel what he wants her to do. And if she was nervous when she first started talking to Gabriel, now she's really nervous because God presents the mission. This is what I want you to do. And in verse 31, Gabriel tells her, You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you were to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Now she's starting to get the scope of this. Oh, you don't want me to be a Sunday school teacher. You just want me to be your son's mom. (laughs) What? I mean, it's scary enough being a parent anytime, right? Especially your first child. You you have all this uncertainty. How am I going to do this? And just think about the added pressure of, oh, yeah, you're going to be the one giving birth to the Messiah, right? He's God in the flesh, and, uh, and he's going to be the Son of the Most High. You're going to call him Jesus because he's going to save the world from their sins. He's going to reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. I mean, she had to be like, oh, is that all? <laughs> you know, Culturally, in their culture, to be chosen for this was amazing. And, and most opportunities to serve God are, but... Man, this is, this is changing the trajectory of her life. Um, she's going to be pregnant before she's married. Now, in, in our culture, it's not as big of a thing as it used to be. But in their culture, being pregnant before you're married was a big deal. Being pregnant before you, while you're betrothed is a big deal. We talked about it last week, right? So the angel appears and, 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 and to Mary, and the angel doesn't appear to Joseph until later. So right now, the angel appears to Mary, oh yeah, you're going you're gonna to be expecting, you're going to have a baby, you're going to be with child, it's going to be my son, but he doesn't even tell Joseph yet. So here she is, she's just been told this, she's going to be expecting, um, her, Joseph doesn't know, her family doesn't know, like we talked last week, the angel appears to her, he eventually appears to Joseph, he doesn't tell anybody else. 
Just think how much easier it would have been on Mary if he'd have gone around and made an announcement to the community or made some type of an announcement to the world that this was going to happen. No, it's just Mary and it's just Joseph. They're the only ones that they tell this to. What's Joseph going to think? What will her family think? What's your community going to think? Joseph found out she was pregnant. He, he wasn't told by the angel. He found out she was pregnant. And he's getting, way to, getting ready to, to, to set her aside privately, to divorce her privately. Why would God choose Mary? I mean, this is, this is a pretty significant thing. Why Mary? 12, 13-year-old girl, girl, very possibly, right? Why Mary? Well, I love this because God looks at our heart, not our qualifications, we, we talk about that at our church a lot, and, and I think it's because it's something that most people struggle with, myself included. God just doesn't look at people the way we do. I, I love that. First Samuel 6, 16, you know, we've, we've read this story before. The prophet Samuel sent to, to choose the next king, and, um, you know, David's family's all prayed it out, and they don't even bring David out. David's back with the sheep, and he doesn't even make the list. And Samuel goes through and says, this isn't the one. No, this isn't the one. This isn't the one. This isn't the one. You know, this isn't the one. He goes down all the sons, and Samuel's confused. He says, is this all your sons? And the dad says, well, there's David. But, you know, he didn't even count enough to bring up the stand with all the other sons. David comes up, and he's the one who's chosen. And I, and I love what this, this tells us about God. Verse 7, in 1 Samuel 16, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, we look in the mirror, and we tend to let everybody else define us. We look in the mirror, and by the time we get to a certain age, we've kind of figured out what group we're supposed to be in. We kind of figured out, you know, all oh, this person's there, they're better at this than me, or they're this, you know, and we kind of put ourselves in this box. And God just doesn't look at you that way. He, he just, he doesn't look at you the way other people do, and, and I love that. Um, he, he could take somebody like Mary, who's a 12, 13-year-old girl, and, and choose them to be the mother of God right? And he can look at you, somebody who you look in the mirror and you say, I, I just don't see it. You know, God comes knocking in my door. I'm like, I think you've got the wrong address, God. You know, he might want to go down the street and check the guy next door. I think that's the guy you're probably looking for. And God says, no, I'm at your house and I'm knocking on your door. God doesn't look at the things the way other people do. First Corinthians 1, I love this passage of scripture. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and despised things of the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so no one may boast before him. I remember doing a commissioning service where Matt was at a church, and they asked me to come and speak as he was getting ready to, to go to a next phase in his ministry. And I remember reading this verse, and, and I remember it says, not, not many of you were wise by human standards, Matt. <laughs> you know? Not many of you were influential, Matt. <laughs> right? Not many of you were of noble birth, obviously, Matt. But God chose the foolish things of the world, Matt, right, to shame the things that are wise. God chose the weak things, Matt, right, to, to, to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things, Matt, right, to, to, and the despised things, Matt, and the things that are not to know if things they are. So no one will boast before him. You can put Matt's name in. You can put your name in. You can definitely put my name in. And the bottom line is that God is not looking at all of those things that we think are qualifications to be used by God. 
He wants something completely different. I love this. You're not too young to be used by God. You're not too old to be used by God. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room to be used by God. You don't have to be the strongest or the most athletic to be used by God. You don't have to have the right job to be used by God. You don't have to be born in the right part of the city to be used by God. You don't have to be a, a guy to be used by God. You don't have to be a girl to be used by God. God just doesn't look at things the way we do. And that's why he looked down and he saw Mary and he said, This is somebody that I want to use. You are, you, are, you are who God says you are. You are not who anybody else says you are. And God says that you're special. He says in Ephesians 2.10, that you are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. I, we read this verse a lot, and I'm going to promise you we're going to keep reading it. Because I want to tell you that you were created to do something good with your life. You were created to bring glory and honor to God, and God made you in a special way and he prepared in advance the things that he wants for you to do. You're God's handiwork. And regardless of whether you think you're good enough or what you are, God has prepared an amazing things for you to do. You know, the question is not whether God can use you. He just tells us right here that he wants to use you and has made you to use you. The question is, are you going to be usable? 2 Timothy chapter 2 is a pretty interesting passage of scripture. It says, in the wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are made, used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, you'll be ready for the master to use you for every good work, all right? What in the world is that talking about? I apologize in advance for the next picture. I'm just as hungry as you are, <laughs> When you look at this, what do you see? I see a baked potato with extra butter. Oh, that's good stuff, right? I see a steak that's cooked medium, maybe, and it just, you look at that, you see, that looks amazing. You probably don't look at that and say, check out that plate. Right? Isn't that fork awesome, right? We're the plate, right? We're, we're the fork. Um, it's not about the dishes. It's not about the utensils. It, it's, it's about what, what God uses them for. This is a prayer that I, I pray fairly re frequently. You know, um, I, a long time ago, I stopped asking God, telling God how to use me. Um, I just want to be usable, right? I, I want to be the guy that when God goes up to get a plate out, he doesn't have to put it back, right? Right? He says, I can use you for this. It doesn't even matter what you're being used for. You know, you, you, it, the matter, it, what matters is that it you're being used. That God is using you for the purpose that he created you. And, and, and too often we, we get too caught up in being the plate and being the, the fork and being all these things. But it's not your job to choose how you'll be used by God. It's your job to be usable. And when God looked down at Mary, what he saw, he saw she's usable because she was fully committed to God. You know how we know that? Because she didn't say, you must be knocking at the wrong door, right? God chose Mary because she would believe him. How do we know that? Luke chapter 1, verse 38. 
It says, the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words. Wonder what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. What made her be the plate that God said, I want to use you? You know, I just want to stop and just, I I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. Are, Are you a plate? Are you a vessel? Are you a utensil that God feels comfortable using? Does it ever happen at your house, the same thing that happens at my house? Where you think somebody has run the dishwasher and they really haven't, but you put all the dishes away? (laughs) <laughs> and you start getting dishes out, and you're like, what happened here, right? I can't use this. I usually blame Sue. That's my go-to. Uh, but I don't want God to pull something out and say, what happened? And put me back up. You don't want God to pull you out and say, I've got this thing. Oh, you're not clean. You're not pure. There are things in your life that shouldn't be there. I'm going to have to put you back up and pull out another dish, pull out another utensil. God chose Mary because she was pure and because she loved God and because she would believe him. He said, you're highly favored. You found favor with God. Why? Why was she highly favored? Why did she find favor with God? He actually answers that later in the passage when Mary goes to visit her relative, uh, who's Elizabeth, who's getting ready to have John the Baptist. She's six months pregnant with John the Baptist. She shows up the house, and this is what Elizabeth said. She says, why am I so favored in Luke 1.43? Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promise to her. God chose Mary because Mary would actually believe him. You know, this is kind of a a hard thing to say. And I know we're sitting in church and everything, and maybe, you know, appalled that maybe I'm implying something here, but do you really believe God? We come, we talk about all the things that he is. We talk about, you know, how, how he's with God, nothing's impossible. We talk about all these things. But do we really believe him? We know it, but do we live like we believe it? Mary did, and that's why he chose her. You have any idea how different your life would be if you could just believe God? Matthew 17, Jesus said, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. What he told Mary in Luke chapter 1, he says, Listen, no word from God will ever fail. Gabriel said, Look, I'm telling you this, and no word from God will ever fail. And Mary believed him. What's the difference between Mary and Zechariah? Gabriel appears to Zechariah, and Zechariah's response was, in Luke 1.18, he asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm old, my wife is well long in years. He began to give excuses and reasons why he didn't think this was possible. How can I believe this? How can I be sure of this? Zechariah's response was, I'm not sure I believe you. Mary's response, Luke 1.34, after Gabriel tells her this gives the past, relays the message, She says, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. Now, this isn't, she's not saying, how will this be like I don't believe it. She's like, okay, how's this going to (laughs) happen? You know, it's like, I believe you, but how are you going to do this? And that is so cool. The angel answers her, explains it very clearly. The Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. For the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Do you understand any of that? I can tell you that most theologians don't understand really any of that. Right? That's the explanation given. And Mary goes, oh, okay. You know, if, if you said it, I believe it. And, uh, and that's going to settle it for my heart. You know? And he goes on and says, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. 
she who was said to be unable to conceive in the sixth month, for no word of God will ever fail, right? We can look in this passage, and, and we can see all kinds of things. We can see the Trinity, you know, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, the power of the Most High, God the Father, is, is going to cause one to be born, the Son. You see the Trinity in there. You see the incarnation, God becoming man in there. But I got to say, how this all happens is really confusing. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit will come on you. But Mary says, oh, so that explains it. And her response is just textbook faith. What is faith? Let's be reminded. Hebrews 11, 6. It's the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we don't see. I don't understand it, but I believe you, God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know why Mary was chosen? Um, because Mary's attitude was so different sometimes than ours. If I were to say, I need some volunteers to fill in the blank, I can tell you what immediately happens. <laughs> Everybody tries, starts to get small. You start looking at other places, right? Same way I do. You know, Mary's response to being, being called and used by God, Mary's response was, pick me, right? <laughs> pick me. I love that. Luke 138, she says, I'm the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Mary had this right. The Lord is not my servant. I am the Lord's servant. If this is what you want for my life, your word to me be fulfilled. And the angel left. She's saying, God, you're the master. You sit on the throne of my life. A servant does what the master asks. Use me as you wish. We see later her response to this, she, this song that she sings. It says in Luke 146, it says, Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm and has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things and has sent the rich away empty. He helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. You know, we tend to look at Mary, we tend to go one of two directions. We tend to overemphasize her. This story is really not about Mary. It's about a Savior that's going to be born. Mary's the plate, right? She's, she's the utensil that's being used. And sometimes we tend to, to underemphasize Mary and sometimes we tend to overemphasize Mary. We need to kind of, but we do need to recognize that while this isn't about Mary, I, I, I just, as I begin to think about this, why would God choose her? It's kind of humbling to see. And, and the reasons why God chose to use her are the same reasons why God would choose to use you. So, so let's wrap it up. Mary's initial response to being chosen was what? To be afraid. She was uncertain. That's pretty normal. God presents the mission to her. He looks at her heart and not her qualifications. And God chose Mary largely because she would believe him. Mary's response, pick me. I hope that would be your response. And, and I hope that will be my response. If God calls us to do something that, that, you know, picks us, I need somebody. He said, I need somebody. Isaiah said, here am I, send me, right? I hope that will be us. 
Not the guy who kind of slumps down in his chair and looks around, won't make eye contact. God pick me, God choose me. What, what I hope we walk away from this is that we would want to be the vessel, the, the utensil, the dishes that God could use. That we don't really care how we're being used, but more that we're just being usable. And we're living our lives in such a way that God can use us. What a cool story leading up to next week where we talk about the birth of Christ. Let's pray. Most holy God, I thank you so much for our time together this morning. And um, the challenge as we look at the faith of what many of us would look at and say, she's just a little girl. You saw so much different. And God, help us to realize that you see us differently than others, and you see us differently than often we see ourselves as well. God, let us be usable. God, I pray that our, our heart's desire would just to be to be taken off the shelf for whatever purpose you would have. To be used by you is just the greatest honor and purpose we could possibly have in our life to in some way be used to be glory and honor to you. God, I just pray that you would let us just look for those opportunities and be aware when you come knocking at our door and say, okay, God, pick me. Lord, we love you today. And God, we, we want to be what you want us to be, but sometimes we just get kind of lost. Open our eyes today. Let us have a faith and a belief and a willingness like Mary to be used by you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand, just an attitude of prayer. And um, do you feel usable? Are you willing to say, God, I was planning on doing this, but if you, if you want me to do something else, then I'll do that. Are you willing to set aside your insecurities in yourself and place your security in God who's more than able to handle whatever he's asking you to do? Mary gives us a great example. And uh, I'm thankful for that. It's humbling. Will you pray that you would just have a pick-me mentality when God comes knocking? Watch and see. If you keep the porch light on, he might even come knocking, right? You know? This time is for you. You may need to just spend some time praying and say, God... I have been so lost in everything that's going on, so caught up in the busyness of this Christmas season. I've let the stress and all the rest of this just completely overwhelm me. I want to come back and remember what this is about. This time is yours as the music plays. Would you spend some time talking to God? Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure, and how great the pain of searing the Father turns His face away Has wounds which Martha chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross 
my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that hailed him until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished Most Holy God, you've done so much for us We can't even begin to put into words what it means to be able to have a relationship with you. God, I want to pray if there's anybody here this morning or, or joining us online who's never done that. They could, they could just experience the joy and the peace and the forgiveness and the acceptance and the love that comes because of what your son did on the cross. God, I just ask that you'd help each of us just to look in our hearts. See if there's anything that might be hindering you using us. Whether it's being used to mop floors or to line fields for soccer or to go overseas or to be a pastor or to lead a Bible study or to serve whatever you want, God. Let's just be available for that. Whatever, whatever you want. No greater joy in our lives than to be used by you. Help us just to grasp that. In your son's name we pray. Wow, we'll have a seat. Uh, I'm so glad that you guys are here. It is with great uh, begrudgingly that I do this next thing. The chili cook-off was Wednesday night. Chris, here's your trophy. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. No. Chris, Chris cooked an amazing pot of chili. We're very excited. Chris, congratulations. The coveted trophy that Rachel gets to keep on her mantle all year. Oh, Rachel, we're so jealous. So, <laughs> we're very excited about that. Tonight, we're having our church Christmas party, and you're all invited. Um, the church is, we're just going to pick up some fried chicken, and we're going to fry drinks, bring side dishes and desserts. We're going to do our gift exchange. If you've never been a part of our gift exchange uh, I don't know how to explain it other than it gets a little rough, all right? So we steal gifts, we have a lot of fun, and uh, last year the most coveted gift had to have been the pair of socks with my face on all over the, over the socks. It was, uh, wow, I was so jealous, I didn't, I didn't get the gift, I lost it, and, uh, but it wound up on my front porch this year, so tonight I think I might dig those socks out, wear them, uh, to show you just what you could be missing by, by not coming. So anyway, we're going to have a gift exchange. It's just a small gift for a man, a small gift for a woman. Uh, the parents usually bring a gift for their own child to open just so they have something to do during this. Um, it's just really just a lot of fun together. I believe that God created the church to be together. I believe that God created the church to be a family. And I believe that together we are more than we could ever be apart. We can worship God online, we can pray to God at home, we can read our Bibles and learn about Him on the internet, but that is not the church. The church is when we come together. And if you read in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 2, that early church spent time together. And tonight we're going to do that, and it's just going to be fun. Uh, it won't be very spiritual, I'll just prepare you for that, but it is going to be fun as we enjoy being together as a family, and I think that's important. So that's tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, we'd love for you to come. Uh, next Sunday morning, we'll have our Christmas service. And then next Sunday night, 
At six o'clock, we'll also have our Christmas Eve service for those who would like to be a part of that. Um, hang in there. Um, remember what this is all about. I'd like to invite you to stand as we're dismissed with a song. Thank you for joining us today. Hope to see you tonight.